firstly, thanks to Terry Snow and the fabulous Wollinga Parks, marvellous venue for conferences as well as competition. Um, and I'd also like to thank the coaching committee in, in New South Wales for allowing us to talk this morning. Uh, this presentation is, has three different sections. Um, and I'm just going to quickly tell you how it came about. So we had the opportunity to apply for a grant through the Department of Health that is about increasing the opportunities for social inclusion for marginalised groups, one of which is, is people with disabilities. So we thought that would be a fantastic opportunity for us in New South Wales to find ways to increase the number of people with disabilities to get involved in equestrian sport. So I'm sure you've all seen something about para dressage around the traps and hopefully you've watched the games and waved the flag. Um, but we have been really concerned about the very low numbers. So we're going to tell you briefly about the project and what opportunities there'll be for coaches, officials and clubs to get involved, as well as riders and people who maybe don't ride but have got skills we could use in our clubs and competitions people with disabilities that may well have fantastic skills that can help us run events. Sue Cunningham is going to talk about um, the classification structure briefly, just so you understand how the system works. And then Mary Longdon, who's up on the top of the screen there from Melbourne, is going to talk about some coaching tactics and ideas and concepts about how you can approach helping riders with disabilities. And then if we get time at the end, we're just going to have a little short overview of how the competition currently operates. And we have a little video of Emma Booth at the end that if we run out of time in the presentation, we'll play it. And while you're having a cup of coffee, you can have a look at it. It only goes for about five minutes. All right. So my name's Jenny Carroll, if you don't know might me. I've had various roles in, in New South Wales and dressage New South Wales and EA over the years. Um, but at the moment, this is our very exciting project. So I'm just going to show this video first. This is Stina uh, Klastrup from Denmark. Um, and this just gives you a little profile and explanation of what can happen in Paris. To be an FBI world champion is out of this world. It's much more that I ever dreamed of. It's. Uh, Wow, it's been an amazing month, this one, just like getting to realize what happened and seeing my rise, and I'm really proud and happy about it, I am. Following Stinnikastrup's success at the World Equestrian Games in Tryon last month, we caught up with the paradressage rider and her horse Smarties at home in Denmark. The World Equestrian Games was a huge goal for me and Smarties this year. Um, this is unfortunately the last competition, the last championship I will have on Smarties. And I knew that before leaving and uh, I really wanted it to make, be worthwhile and to be, uh, yeah, to be an event I, I, I would remember forever. And I must say it, it will be. It's been years of hard work, it's been years of training and it all really just came down to that moment and, and uh, for that to work out was amazing. Clinching not one but two gold medals exceeded all Stinner's expectations. I screamed my lungs out. It was, um, I, the score went up and I was so happy. It was a personal best, first of all, which is amazing to be able to do that at the World Equestrian Games. I was really happy with Smarties. He was, uh, as always, a huge friend in there. And it, it meant the world, it really did. It was very emotional. Stinner's international career took off when she was just 16 years old with the World Equestrian Games in Kentucky, but horses have always played a big part in her life. I really love animals. I always loved animals. And I think today that's still my main drive in this. I love working with horses. I love being around horses. I was born without legs, so when I was really young, my parents started to take me to physiotherapy riding because it's really good for the muscles. When you're in a wheelchair, you don't use the same muscles as you do when you walk. And to be in a horse is the only way to stimulate the same muscles. So um, that's what, what started it. And luckily, I just fell totally in love the first time I sat on a horse. For me, it's normal not to have any legs. And I live a totally normal life. Do what everybody else my age is doing. I have a nice boyfriend. I, we have a nice apartment, a little dog. And, and for me, the, the 
problems that I do face are the same as everybody else, but it's not related to my disability. Um, that's just another way I get around. Living a normal but very accomplished sporting life, Stinner puts much of her success down to her equine partnership. Smarties is the best horse for me. He's, uh, he really is perfect. He really wants to work for me. He really, really wants to do his best. And he gets my slightest signals. He will know what to do. Like, I just have to think sometimes. And then he knows, like, he's so sharp on me. He's perfect for me. He really is. We're perfect for each other, I think. He likes the para. He's been a Grand Prix horse, which I don't think suited him that well. But this he really loves. So we're good for each other. Away from the competition arena, and as with every horse and rider partnership, there's a huge team that work with Stinner and Smarties to help them achieve their goals. I have the best groom in the world, my uh, Nicolina, who was with me in, in Tryon. She's amazing. I think that us riders are nothing without our grooms. They're incredible. I have the, a very supportive boyfriend. His father is my trainer as well. and. Uh, and he's used to the environment, he's used to, he knows what it takes to, uh, to be an athlete on, on this level. He never complains, uh, no matter how long I spent with the horse. After moving away from her childhood home, Stinner still finds time to head back and catch up with the family. My mom, she's been amazing. Uh, I moved away from, from her, so it's a different setup now, but for all the years I've been riding, uh, she's been super supportive and she's, done everything she could to help me and I'm, I'm really lucky about that. I have two brothers, so it's been chaotic, it's been crazy, it's been so much fun. I think it's been really good for me because they just threw me around in the, in the yard and, and they didn't really care that I had a disability or anything. They just treated me like everybody else. And I think that's a gift to, to have that so early in life. Stinner's achievements have been recognized globally as she's recently been nominated for the 2018 FEI Best Athlete. To be nominated for, for Best Athlete is, uh, is an honor I can't describe. Uh, being a para is, is, you know, it's not up there with the show jumping and dressage yet. So to be able to get that recognition from the FEI, and it's, it means the world, it really does. But for Stinner, there's still one major goal that remains. I have a European goal, I have a world equestrian goal. I need a Paralympic goal, <laughs> I do, I do. I don't know if we'll be in Turkey or we'll be in Paris, but it will be sometime, yeah. We're sure that Stinner will one day realise that Paralympic goal and wish her all the best in her future. <laughs> it makes no stir up November look very tame, doesn't it? Um, so I did forget to mention that our next um, uh, segment of our presentation too involves the masterclass that's straight after this presentation. So one of the riders is Sharon Jarvis, one of our Paralympic hopefuls for Tokyo. Um, so Rosie's going to talk about it and you'll be able to see a coaching session with um, Sharon and Rosie and they'll talk a little bit about their journey and how they've worked out how they operate. Okay, I'll just see if I can get this next slide up. Okay, so now but the challenge with setting up this project was we wanted to increase numbers. And really, there's a few shocking statistics we should be aware of. Four out of 10 people in Australia over 18 identify as having some kind of disability that impacts on their life. So in, now with the um, focus for Sport Australia is more inclusion right across the board. We see the benefits of any sort of sport and participation and being involved in your community is a really high priority. So besides the major funding for elite sport, this has become a very significant part of the focus for, <coughs> excuse me, Sport Australia. At the moment, these figures are a little bit rusty, but at the end of last year, we had roughly 18,000 EA members, only 140 roughly on the current master list for para. And Sue will talk about the master list in a moment. But in other words, they're the only identified people as members that we know of that have some form of disability that's been identified. Um, you can see statistically that doesn't come anywhere near 40% of membership. So there's a whole lot of people out there who could be involved in sport that we could uh, welcome into the fold. So we thought there were a number of challenges with how do we increase that number? 
And the, the first one would be, well, we just advertise more and get everybody to come along to the classification day and off we go. However, there are people probably even in this room or some of your own students who have attempted classification and been bitterly disappointed because they actually don't meet the criteria required. So Sue's going to talk about what that structure looks like, but we've then had to think about, well, what else do we need to do to help people come along? So we know coaches and clubs and officials need some support. You need to feel confident that you know what you're doing, um, how to approach it, make sure everything's safe. That's usually the biggest concern for a club. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do with these riders with disabilities? They're going to fall off and they're going to cause a riot or somebody else's horse is going to run into them. And you can see from Stinner, you just get on with it. As long as people have got the appropriate space and everyone knows what they're doing, it all works fine. Yes, they fall off, just like able-bodied riders do. Um, so because of that classification restriction, what we've come up with in our project is we probably need another category to support the para classification. So we've got a bit inventive when we're calling it equability. And that category that we're going to develop and test in New South Wales for the next year um, is we're putting the rules around it at the moment, but it won't have anywhere near as restrictive or prescriptive a classification requirement. And we think it's going to allow us to do things like have a category in a prelim dressage test now where we might have a subcategory of amateur owner riders, a subcategory of junior riders, a subcategory of pony riders. We could have a subcategory of equability riders in there. Yes, some may still only be able to do a walk test, but we have para tests that we can use for that. But we think this structure will make it a lot more flexible for clubs. That they don't feel so much, oh, gosh, we've got to have another arena, and we've got to have other judges, and we've got to do this and that. So if we can get some of these ideas going, support the riders so that they feel confident that they're prepared, and we think a really significant part of that is having a connection with a coach from the beginning, if we can. And there's two obvious reasons for that. You can see the riders who have coaches at this competition, how much easier it is for them to prepare and know what's expected. Many people come into riding for the therapeutic aspects and then decide to participate in competition, but the, uh, they have no idea of the rules. They don't know where to look for the rules. <laughs> they don't know what's possible and what's not. They don't even know where they have to go to present at the beginning. So if we can help by producing some resources um, to help everyone do that, but as well as that, help coaches by expanding their skills so that you feel prepared, that's where we're heading with the project. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just going to flick through these so we can get to the important things. So apart from all the obvious benefits of people feel good for involving the riders and the riders need to feel welcome. That's been a significant comment to us from riders previously. You know, when they cut, when they approach a club and they you know get the big sigh, oh, you know that's mm, that's too hard. They, they immediately are on the back foot. So we need to make people feel welcome. But there's actually a lot of political and strategic benefits for people. And if our sport shows that it is more accessible, you'll be surprised how many more avenues for funding come out of that. So that's a very hard nosed benefit straight away. Um, and even with your local council, there's lots of opportunities for getting assistance for building facilities and ramps if they're needed. But Mary has a, a very funny story about there was a fabulously expensive ramp built at a competition that nobody needed. So they had to make the riders use it so that, the, you know, the sponsors felt good about the money they'd invested. So it's about consultation as well, obviously. So the project goes until December 2022. We've got a range of activities happening around the state. And in the second year, we also have the chance to test a couple of the things we've been working on in other states. At the end of the project, then what we want to do is then present all the state branches, the discipline committees, EA, well, this is what we've been doing. This is how it's worked for us. Um, you, now over to you to see whether this will work nationally. Um, in one way, we should have started at the top, but we now have the luxury, we can practice and experiment. If things don't work, we can have another go and try it a different way um, and then still get some feedback from the states about whether you think that will work. All right. Um, so we have a great project team with a wide variety of skills that are used to us. 
very exciting to work with uh, the team. We have um, a little expression of interest, Survey Monkey, and I've got a flyer down here I'll pull out if anybody's interested in putting your name down, just as an expression of interest, because most of the activities for this project in the next two years will be free to all participants. So it'd be a great way to get a bit of professional development um, and hopefully we can be recognised for some coaching update points if you're interested in those. Um, then we'll go from there. So now Sue's going to talk about classification. And often this is the thing that people get very confused about. It's quite a straightforward process when you know the background. Thanks, Sue. Okay. So it is classification is a bit confronting. Um, and part of that reason is that it's done by two people. So let me just move on and explain why we do it and what it is. So an athlete has to have a permanent, verifiable and measurable physical or visual impairment, which is supported by medical evidence. So what it really means is that worldwide, 17%, someone with an impairment that impacts on their performance by 17%, can be classified and that will put them in the least impacted grade and I'll get onto that in a minute. So and we do this, they have to go through this process and even with RDA it's called assessment because we need to make sure that the riders are safe and that we're putting them on horses they can manage. So when they're assessed, they're at the currently they're divided into five groups. And grade one is just walk only, and they can trot in their freestyle. Grade two is walk with these movements in the test. Grade three, so they just get a little harder as the tests go up. And really grade three would be like um, novice to elementary. Grade four is like medium, and grade five is pre St George. Or almost, it has flying changes, it has half pirouettes, that sort of thing. And people, depending on their assessment and their classification, are then allocated to a grade. And we do that so that everybody is on the same level playing field. And it, it is a bit tricky because you look at someone that, like Stinner who doesn't have any legs, is in the same grade with someone who has two perfectly good legs. But what they do in the classification is measure people's core strength, their coordination. Um, it's quite a complex process. It takes a couple of days for everybody to go through. Then they're watched riding as well, just to make sure that they can ride. And these grades, this is to start with. So if you've got MS, for instance, your condition is going to deteriorate. So you'll be reviewed and perhaps have to go to a different grade to keep up with your condition. And we try not to say lower grade, even though it's like one, two, three, four, five, because in each grade we have three tests, or well, we actually have more than three. But, um, so the individual test is like the Grand Prix of that grade, and it's quite difficult. So this is why we do the classification, and this is where we put people so that they have half a chance of competing fairly in the sport. Um, so as, as we've just said here. And also then to compete in FEI classes and paraquestrian classes in Australia, you need to be classified, which is what Jenny was talking about. Not everybody wants to do that. Not everyone wants to ride at the Olympic Games or at the state championships. So we're trying now to provide a space for these people who just want to come out and have a nice time on their horse. Um, and that's the, the main thrust of the project. So also at our, um, is at our uh, um, access are these exemption cards and they are something that you can, you don't have to be classified to get these exemption cards, but the classification allows you to use some compensatory aids and with these exemption cards you can ride in able body competition with, let me give you an example, um, in para, you can ride in a snaffle bridle or a double bridle. It's your choice. doesn't matter what grade you're in. So that facility would go through so you could ride in able-bodied classes using that. Or two wicks, yeah. 
if you don't have legs like Sinner, you need two whips. And that's another one that you can get an exemption for and still ride in able-bodied classes. So this is quite a good thing for us to be pr uh, promoting. So it does take two classifiers to decide what grade these people should be in. Usually it's one from the country that you're in and um, an inter another international classifier. And they, um, they, they write a report on you physically, mentally, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are. And then together they decide. So Sharon, Jav, uh, Sharon Gregory is the head of classification in Australia, but not only that, she's head of classification worldwide for the FEI. Um, and part of our project is to try and find some more classifiers because we can't get people into the system if we can't grade them. And then there's a wait list for all of that. So we're hoping to be able to develop some, um, some new classifiers. And to be a classifier, you need to be a doctor, a physiotherapist, osteopath, something like that, to do the course. Um, compensating aids. These are just aids that keep you safe, that give you not an advantage over other riders, but that give you the ability to ride as well as they can with the disability that you might have. So there are, um, so this is what a compensating aid is. There are standard and non-standard. So the standard ones are rising and sitting, double or snaffle bridle, and the non-standard ones are things like you can see here. Um, the closed toe stirrup is a standard one, but the loops in the reins. So this is for somebody who perhaps has shorter arms and needs, can't just, oops, sorry, can't just take up the slack in their reins, so they have to move from one loop to another. And in the sport, we also have walking, extended walk and walk on a long rein. And for us, so for these riders, it's with short arms. It's very hard to put your arms forward. So they lean forward and take up the last loop. And then we're judging the intent of the extended walk that we're looking at. So here you have a saddle that's been adapted for someone without legs. They are Velcro. Some thinner is not, but some riders are Velcroed onto the saddle. They're very strict about the amount of Velcro because you actually have to be able to fall. If you're in trouble, you need to be able to fall off. You can, all riders don't have to take their hands off the reins. They can salute with their head. You can use your voice in grade one, two, and three because you might not have legs or you might have very weak legs. And so as long as the voice is used quietly and not sort of loudly or repetitively, voice is fine. Um, you can have offset spurs if you need to. You can have curved whips. Um, there's a compensatory panel that looks after all of this. So it's quite a complicated thing. So we can have for the non-standard aids, um, again, someone with really short arms, like a thalidomide person, usually their arms are finishing here and they may have little fingers or something or they finish just above the elbow. In that case, for you to get a direct line from the horse's mouth through to what would be a stump here, you can have a little leather strap on your saddle with a ring on the end of it, and the rein goes through the ring, so the line is more direct, and then it's attached here to your arm. So all of these, it's fascinating, I have to say, really. Some of the aids are just amazing to help people enjoy our sport. So um, this is the compensating aids panel. The FEI have that panel. And people come up with new ideas all the time. The, the idea, pictures of it, the description of it goes to the panel and then they decide whether that's going to be acceptable or not. Um, here's another example for you. This is a rain adaption. They've also now just approved a knot in the rain. So that it's a quite, if you have arthritis in your hands, you certainly do when you get gray hair and as old as I am, it's quite hard to hold the rain. So a knot is something that's really useful. So they've now just approved all of that. And this lady is quite extraordinary. This is Bettina, she's from um, Germany. She has no arms at all. And her reins go from her toes through the bit to her teeth. Just, and a beautiful rider. So, the, um, let me just finish before I introduce Mary to you. The master list is a worldwide list. It's, it's called the FEI Paraquestrian Master List. 
On that list go the 120 riders that we have in Australia. And on the, they are given a little card. But on the list, anyone can access that list. So clubs who want to run a para equestrian day can just look up their rider on the list and it will give you things like their age, their date of birth, their grade, the sort of equipment that they can use. And when we're all out there judging for the judges amongst us, we don't always get told that there's a para rider in the group. But what should happen is that a copy of that master list with that person's name on it will be in the folder for us so that we know that that's a para rider and that para rider can sit or rise. That para rider can have two whips. It, she or he can have whatever sort of aids uh, permitted on the card. So the master list is vital for the progress of the sport. And now that's, that's a very short <laughs> condensed version of classification, but it just gives you some idea of what people have to go through. Um, and I just quickly, an example of classification was there was, I was doing a technical delegates course in Germany and they, the classification was a part of that. And one of the riders came in and she's someone I know quite well, Elke Phillips. She's um, a German rider. She is usually on crutches, but she's always bright and breezy and cheery. Then she came on her crutches quite um, securely. They sat her on a chair that didn't have any arms. And then they said, so can you touch your finger to your nose? Yes, she can. Then they asked her to do it faster. Just could not do that. Then they asked her just to turn her head from side to side and then to do that a bit faster. And then we actually have to hold her in the chair because her core strength is not good. So this lady has very little core strength. She has no legs that are of any use to her. And then at the end of it, we're all almost in tears going, that's enough, we just don't want to see any more of this. She's, the classifier said to her, so would you show the group your throat? And she's got a tracheotomy. And, I just, and she is out there winning medals on her horse, a huge black horse. I mean, it's just amazing what this sport brings out in people. So now I'm going to pass you over to Mary, who's going to talk in much more detail about coaching. As you can see up here, Mary's a level three coach and educator and assessor. She's an international consultant. She's the wonderful author of a book called Coach with Courage. I don't know if any of you read it, but it's really quite amazing. Um, and I think now, Mary, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I think it's really exciting what you're doing with equability. Um, and it's great that you're doing it in New South Wales and then we can have it in Victoria and everywhere else in Australia. So thank you. Could I have the next slide, please? Okay, so I think that people are scared about teaching people with disabilities, but all of you would be teaching quite a lot of people that have learning problems and have broken their legs, they've got stiff legs, they don't sit straight. So it's just a matter of um, not being scared about it really. And I'm sure that you've worked out with all your riders how they learn the best. So sometimes it's a bit harder with riders with a disability, but it's a great challenge. Next one, please. So Ted was a was a chiropractor, he used to ride, used to ride stock horses, and then he had a stroke, and then he actually, this is his horse, he ended up doing RDA competition and really enjoying it. He just loved the social part of it all. Okay, next one, please. So people come, they're either born with a disability uh, and a lot of these people are actually the grades one and two and three. Uh, so if you have a rider with, for instance, cerebral palsy, you can look up uh, on the website for the Australian Cerebral Palsy or the American Cerebral Palsy Association and get a whole lot of information. But then you're actually looking at the person as an individual. So people can be born with uh, an intellectual disability. A lot of those happen actually during the birth process. Uh, and then aut autism, there are so many people now with autism. And so find out a little bit about them because they can ride really well, 
but how you teach them the first time is how they will always do it. We had a Philippine rider that came over to a competition here and he'd been taught to ride square corners. So he, his horse went out of the arena and then came back in again. He just had no idea because he was literally riding a square corner. So I'm sure that a lot of you teach people who are on the spectrum. Maybe some of you are on the spectrum yourself. Uh, and then other people are born with multiple disabilities. They can have cerebral palsy and they can be blind uh, and have an intellectual disability. But don't just presume because somebody has a major physical disability that they have an intellectual disability as well. And someone that has had a brain injury uh, may still have a high intellect but there are parts of the brain that have been damaged that don't work. So you really do have to get to know your riders. And then you have acquired from an accident and then you have a disease and disease can happen at any age with a rider. But we have a lot of people that ride in uh, Equestrian Australia that have MS that don't even talk about having MS but then when they, their disease progresses, then they may need a little bit more help. So everybody's individual. Next one, please. So these are sort of the common reactions from coaches that they don't have the skills, they don't know anything about the disability. Um, and is, there's always a worry when you can't understand what somebody is saying, but when that happens, there'll be somebody that can interpret for you. So I teach a lot of people that have athetoid cerebral palsy. So they have writhing movements and it's really hard for them to speak. And sometimes you don't understand a word they're saying. So you have to find, you, you might use yes, no answers, questions, uh, but definitely get someone that's going to help you with that side. Uh, as an excuse, you can say that you don't have time to take them on. They are actually quite time consuming. They take longer than someone that doesn't have a disability. Uh, yes, they may fall off, they may hurt themselves, but then so may your other riders. So you just gotta be really careful about the safety issue. And if you think if it's really windy and the horse is being silly, well then just stop the lesson. Uh, it is stressful, but the better you are at uh, reading the environment, the less stressful it is. And does it make you nervous? Yes, of course it makes you nervous. But then if you have a rider uh, starting off on a cross-country course, I don't believe that you're not nervous. So that's just one of the things that coaches have to cope with. Next, please. So here we just have examples of... Uh, the grade one rider, she has arthrogryphosis uh, and she has loop brains and Ashley has cerebral palsy. So she's actually very stiff and the, she's the grade two rider uh, and the grade three rider, she was a, the North American young rider champion and the horse going cross country, put its foot in a hole and she was very, very seriously injured. And when I met her first, uh, her mother and her father said, well, her life is over now. And I said, well, not necessarily. And she's been to Paralympics and World Equestrian Games. She's actually on a horse there that came from Australia. Next one, please. And then Emily, uh, she lives on Vancouver Island and she just adores her riding and jumping. So she does a little bit of eventing, so she has to do dressage, but she's, uh, she's not always that well balanced, uh, but she's, she's in a category in grade four where you'd have people that have, um, are completely blind as well. So it's very diverse in the different levels. And then on the right, um, Jenny lives in New Zealand and she was born without her lower arm and uh, she rides at Pre St George and above there. So disability doesn't really stop people, it just makes it harder for them. And so to have a coach that 
has an empathy with them, but doesn't feel sorry for them, uh, is really good. Okay, next one, please. So you just, the communication is where we get into trouble with our able-bodied riders as well as the ones with disabilities. So you just need to find out, can they hear you? Uh, and can they see you? And then this is a really important thing about, do they understand what you're saying? Because the question language is quite different. So you've got to make sure that they actually do understand what you're asking them to do. And can they process what you're asking them? So one of the things about cerebral palsy and about a lot of the physical disabilities is that the brain works, but it just works a little bit slower. So that means that you want to give one instruction at a time and you need to give time for the rider to process this. And I think this is one of the really hard things uh, for an able-bodied coach to learn to do because we give, we speak too much, we give too much information uh, and I actually try and cut it down with my able-bodied riders as well. So if you're teaching someone with autism and you talk about the reins, then there's three different kinds of rain. So it does become confusing for them. And the other thing is things like if you, if you say to someone, your hands aren't level, they could be because one's in front of the other, or it could be because one is above the other one. So demonstrating things is just really effective way with all our riders. So you just got to check, do you have an effective two-way communication? Okay, next one, please. And people have completely different dreams. And our job as a coach is to help the riders achieve their dream, but it really has to be internally motivated. You can't be pushing the riders. And all of you would know this from your able-bodied riders. You see someone with enormous ability and potential, but they don't get there because they just haven't got the internal drive. So it's no different with people with disabilities. Okay. So this little boy um, didn't go to school. Uh, he didn't sit up till he was three. He was adopted by the lady in the on the left-hand side behind him. Um, he has autism and other problems. And through the riding, he, is, he now goes to school full time. And he just loved the competition. Uh, he just thought it was terrific. And the photograph on the left, um, four of them are, have physical disabilities. So they just love their competing. And then the next slide is from New Zealand. Uh, and so she's able to do everything herself. She cleans the paddock. She's got a wheelchair that, that she puts onto a motor and she lunges this little horse who had never been anywhere. And then if you show the next slide, he ended up in London at the Paralympics. Uh, yes, I was extremely nervous because he'd never been anywhere. He, he'd, all he'd done is go through the, is um, living at, outside Churchill and, um, sorry, Christchurch. And uh, so he, it was a whole new thing and his eyes were always on sticks, but he behaved and that was really good. So horses have to be safe and talented and sound for their job. So the next one, please. So what you have to look at is, is the horse suitable for the present standard of the rider? What happens is that a rider wants to go to the Paralympics. So they want to get a dressage horse that's at Puy St. George, but they can't ride properly. They can't balance properly. So then it's just not going to be, it's just not going to work. So have a look at the, present standard of the rider when you're suggesting horses to them. Um, and when you're looking at the horse, does it understand what the rider is asking it to do? Because a lot of problems happen because the horse just simply has no idea and then the rider gets cross and then you lose the goodwill of the horse. And once you've lost its goodwill, uh, then 
you're in trouble. No different from a horse that has a fright jumping into a water jump and then you can't get them anywhere near the water. So it's exactly the same with these horses that we use for people with disabilities. Then Mary, I'm just going to make one comment before we move on. Um, there's quite a balancing act that I've observed between riders who are ambitious and want to be in international competition and those who are just starting. And from some of the th experiences I've had when we're looking for horses for riders that are ready to move into para, many people are still offering us quiet, timid, slow, rickety old horses because they think everyone needs a horse like that. The other side of the scale, as Mary said, is just like all of us, you had to have that opportunity for the progression through different standards of horse to get your confidence, learn your skills, be ready for a bigger moving horse. But like Stinner's horse, if you're looking at horses for international competition, we need exceptional quality paces. In the meantime, though, we need a lot more horses that could have come from anywhere. And my experience was we had a very sharp neck rein trained horse that only one or two people were allowed to ride in the riding school because she was so overreactive. She was sold to a rider with cerebral palsy, um, oh, I, I beg your pardon, who had had uh, another disease when he was young and he rode in calipers, so his legs stuck out like this. She was the only horse in the school that actually tolerated him and it was so easy for him to steer and control her, hand up, go, hand down, stop, turn left, turn right, easy. We would never in a million years have thought that horse would be the one we would have picked straight away. Sorry, Mary, back yes. to you. Yes, absolutely. You just never know. But when I'm offered horses and they say, oh, it's really quiet, I say, no, that's no good. Because the riders that have a physical disability can either get the horse going or they can ride it, but they can't do both because they just don't have enough physical energy and strength. So the horses have to keep themselves going. And the grade one horses that do a five minute test all at the walk and the entire walk has to stay marching and regular and active. It's really difficult. The horses have to be really exceptional horses. But I, I do get concerned that people um, get horses that are not suitable. And if as a coach, you help somebody get a horse and then, and you, think it's going to be the right one and then it's not going to be the right one it's okay to say I've made a mistake we need to get another horse because what we tend to keep doing uh, is going on when we know it's not going to work until it becomes dangerous and the thing is that you often don't know how the horse is going to cope uh, with your rider but if it doesn't work then don't keep doing it Okay, so when you're tr especially training a horse, so let's say you're going with a rider to try a horse. The first thing you've got to do is if they get on in a different way, just do it with the horse so the horse understands it. Otherwise, somebody gets on from the other side and the horse gets a fright before they ever start and then it's just going to be a total disaster. And if they have different leg and seat aids, then teach the horse so when you're teaching a horse to go for a paraplegic rider then you do it from the halt you do new aid which is to touch them with the whips old aid use your legs and it doesn't matter how long you take to teach the horse to do that all that matters is that in the end the horse has learnt and to understand what the new aid is going to be and it's so it's the same with rain aids if your horse um, if the rider's only got one hand, then you need to find out if you're training a horse for this rider and you don't know the rider, which hand it is that they ride with. And then you just teach the horse very quietly. Uh, straightness is a big problem because if somebody doesn't sit straight, then it makes the horse a little bit more crooked anyway. And so few horses are straight. So what we try to do is make sure that the horse is the same weight in both hands and it's forward and it goes at the right tempo. So if it doesn't have a correct base, then it's going to be really difficult for compromised riders to be able to get good results. Uh, and then some, the horses are so clever. They learn to understand um, what is an unintentional aid. 
So um, some of the riders, their arms move around or their legs move around or they sit crooked. And then in the end, you can teach the horse to ignore that and only listen to the intentional aids. Um, another problem is, yes, keep going, is that riders may be able to ride the horse, but they actually can't school it. So if a problem starts to happen when you're teaching somebody, you do need to do something about it straight away because problems get worse, then the horse loses its goodwill and it gives the rider a fright and then that's the end. So no different from any teaching, is it safe, is it effective and is it progressive? So the thing about the progressive is if it's okay in an enclosed area, so maybe somebody's shortening their reins just by pulling their hands sideways. Is it safe? Well, yes, it is safe in an enclosed area. Is it effective? Yes, it shortened the reins. Is it progressive? No. So if something is not going to be safe for the future, don't teach it to your riders now. Okay, so then the next one is all your grade one, next slide, please. All your grade one riders do need to be able to go from trot to walk. So this rider um, had a very bad accident and she's the one that has the rain that's been thickened so she can hold it. And she's really not very safe trotting at all, doesn't like it very much, but she has to have the ability to know how to stop a horse if it gets a fright or goes into trot. Uh, next one, please. So what you see is the result and not the cause, which you all know from coaching, but sometimes it's very difficult to, you think you found the cause, uh, but you actually haven't because there can be several results until you actually find the underlying cause of what you have to uh, fix. And physios are really good at helping you there. So if you're taking on a para rider, then part of your team will be a physio. And it's really great if they know how to ride, but it's not absolutely essential. And I do a lot of coaching from the ground so that you're walking beside the horse, you can feel the reins uh, and give the rider the idea of what it is they're trying to do. Now, the next one, people aren't going to like very much because this is keeping a record. So if there are several people coaching a rider, you need to the rider should have a notebook and then you just write a couple of lines about what you did. And it really is useful, but coaches don't, aren't very good at writing and keeping records. Uh, so all your aim should be measurable. So it could be that they're able to stand in their stirrup for four seconds that you can measure. If your aim is just that they can stand in the stirrups, then you can't measure it. And video coverage is really good for keeping records. Uh, but I think this notebook, and I do it with quite a few riders, uh, is really effective. Okay. So we do tend to overhelp, um, and that, of course, just develops helplessness. So, and it also restricts the progress. Uh, and it also doesn't teach the rider what we want them to know. So now I think I hand back to... Do you you're right to talk about the competition? We've got five minutes to do that. <laughs> oh, okay. And Mary has to rush off probably before we completely finish. So thank you so much, Mary. It's been really wonderful. My pleasure. I'm sorry I can't see you all. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, Mary's, if you look up Mary Longdon, you'll find her website and access to her books and videos. Um, but we're really excited about Mary helping us with the project and with developing coaching skills for riders with disabilities for the future. Thank you, Mary. Yes. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. So, so do you, do you, does Sue want, want to come on now? now? Does she want I'm to here. take over? I am here. You can go now. I've got it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> we'll talk to you very soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, all of you. <laughs> She's wonderful. Um, okay. How does the competition work for the club then, for coaches? 
Grades one, two, and three always ride in an arena that's 20 by 40. And you will see us, you've probably, all of you have been to competitions where you see us rushing around, changing the length of the arena. It helps to realize this and to know this securely if you're running a club and an event so that you can plan when to put in a grade one, two, or three test and only make that change of the arena once. So, you know, it's, it takes less than five minutes to do it, but it certainly can interrupt the flow of the day. So you're probably better off putting the grades one, two, and three towards the end of the day. The other problem with grades one, two, and three is that they're not very good in the mornings. Their drugs don't kick in. Um, so an eight o'clock start is difficult for them. Um, if you can leave it till nine to put them on, but you can get grades four and five to start early. So it's that sort of thinking that you need to have in mind. And we only use these letters, as you can see. Grades four and five are almost always in a 20 by 60 arena. There is a facility for 20 by 40, but that happens mainly in Eastern European countries where they don't have the space. Um, so, but generally these grades four and five people are they're probably also going to ride in the elementary tests or the medium tests or whatever, as well as their para tests. And the types of competition um, that are offered are these para equestrian um, competitions for dressage, straight and national, you can all read this. Our equability we're hoping is going to slot in there and take up a lot of the people that don't fit neatly into these categories. Virtus is an international video competition. We have several Aussie riders who ride in it. Um, and what they have, myself and a couple of other judges from um, the FEI mark these videos and send them back. So we have countries like uh, Russia, England, the USA, Spain, France, um, Uzbekistan, all sorts of places are involved in this competition, which has grown somewhat obviously with COVID and un unable to run the competitions. Special Olympics, we have don't really have a lot to do with the Special Olympics. And RDA, what we're hoping to do is take up some of those RDA riders who are doing really well and then we want to progress to the next step. So we're going, we work quite closely with RDA. We also need to talk to them about how they assess their riders for safety. Um, and then we've obviously got pony club and adult riding clubs and unofficial competitions. So there's lots of scope for these riders to slot into the system. And now we've got a little short video. Have we got time? Yep. yep I think we this is Emma Booth, our Aussie rider who, um, Road at Tryon. I was judging her there. Emma, there's now a rule in the, I'm sure she won't mind saying this, there's a rule called the Australian rule in the FEI rule book for Paris because much to our surprise and almost horror, Emma did two beautiful 360 degree walk pirouettes in her freestyle test. And they were super, but you can't do a 360 degree walk pirouette anywhere Nobody does them. So at the time, everybody was out of their booths because we just didn't know what to do with it. And the judge from Holland is saying, that's it, she's out, she's eliminated. And I'm saying, well, you know, it doesn't say you can't. And so <laughs> eventually we marked her down quite low. And in fact, it cost her a medal because she was just point something off the bronze medal. So the Aussie rule. Emma is a super, super um, representative of our country and the sport. Uh, she's really, truly amazing. So we've just got a brief video. Oh, oh. So, so we might just finish up because we showed this yeah. at the end. This, just, this is just an overview. And just seeing Emma and how she operates in her stables at home, a little like Stinner's video. But the other thing I think we've forgotten to just re-emphasise is that people with intellectual disabilities aren't necessarily classifiable as para riders unless they have physical disabilities. So that is why that large group of riders with intellectual disabilities at the moment Apart from competitions at RDA, there is now the mm. Virtus competition. Some have participated in Special Olympics, but there's a, quite a few rules around that that don't suit our sport particularly well. One of which I was told recently, I'm, I'm very sure this is correct, but the idea of Special Olympics is you try different sports. So you, if you want to compete at Special Olympics, you can only ride in, in horse sports for two cycles. 
for most of us, it takes us that long to have learnt what we're doing and how to get on with it. So um, that's really not, not such a, a good thing for us. So versus competitions um, and being able to integrate people with intellectual disabilities into our sport under safe guidelines with an assessment that they're safe and able to control their horse in, in an open space, um, we think is going to be really um, exciting future for the sport. And in New South Wales, quite a number of clubs already have been doing that themselves, which is fantastic. Local riders have come to them and said, we want to participate. They've just made the system work for them. As part of our equability project, it's likely that, that can then become an official level of competition. So we think that's very exciting. So thank you for your attention. We'll just play this to finish, I think. Yeah. And we've got one little photo at the end if we get time. Um, and I'm sure you look forward to seeing the masterclass with Rosie outside. Hi everyone, my name's Emma Booth. I'm an Australian Paralympian and you are here with me today in Langwarren South at my small training facility with my team of horses. So I've been riding ever since I was 11 uh, and I rode all through high school. I started uni, I actually rode overseas for a dressage rider in Germany um, in 2011. And then in 2013, April 2013, I was coming home from a horse competition with a friend and uh, we were involved in a really serious car accident in which a truck jackknifed onto the wrong side of the road as we were coming around a corner and we had a head on. Um, yeah, a, a lot of injuries, the most significant being um, the injury to my spine and spinal cord. Uh, meaning that I'm now an L2 paraplegic in a wheelchair. Um, but, you know, the, the team at the Royal Melbourne Hospital where I had my surgery, where I was immediately taken and, and where I was in ICU, they were absolutely incredible. Uh, and the staff there, what they do on a daily basis is beyond amazing. The horses yeah. and the riding uh, has definitely given my life purpose again and it's given my life meaning um, and it definitely keeps me motivated and, and yeah, something to look forward to. So it was six months after the accident when I was able to ride again, which was absolutely amazing and just one of those days that I'll remember forever. I'd set myself goals prior to getting back in the saddle of I knew I wanted to ride again. Um, I'd made the goal of wanting to get to the Paralympics in Rio, but it was probably not until I was actually in the saddle again that I realised that was actually what I really wanted to do and something that I was probably able to do. Um, I just felt completely at home in the saddle even after, after my accident. The road to Rio was it's a bit of a blur really, you know, it was all, it happened so quickly, it was ups and downs, you know, one minute we didn't have a horse and it was looking like it wasn't going to happen and then we found the horse and we realised it was. A good family friend of mine did a cycle around Australia to raise funds for me to be able to purchase the horse. Uh, and the support that he received financially, you know, strangers were donating and it was just, it was absolutely a bit mind-blowing and I still think that even today you kind of really have to sometimes stop yourself and remind yourself of what a huge effort it was for everyone involved. Rio was a new journey altogether and again roller coaster, an emo emotional roller coaster it was. Um, it was still one of the best things I've ever done and uh, you know, one of my favourite things about Rio was staying in the Paralympic Village. That was just absolutely incredible and something that you really can't put into words. It was the most incredible place and that is also part of the reason I think I wanted to push myself to get to the next one as well and probably why I'll, I'll want to do it again after because, yeah, it's just, yeah, one of those amazing, amazing things. My saddle's slightly modified uh, to accommodate my um, disability in my riding. It's basically a, it's a standard dressage saddle but 
just a few little alterations. The knee blocks on mine are also shortened and I've got an extra one at the back. So that just offers a little bit of extra support to keep me in there. Um, but yeah, that's other than that, all the gear that we use is the same, bridles and, and everything is all, all the same. Zidane is actually a Danish warm blood, so he was imported from Denmark before I purchased him and a, a few years before I purchased him. And then um, he had only done able body dressage, he'd never done para dressage, but uh, again, the, the qualities that I look for in an off the track horse, he is just willing, he's intelligent, he's quiet, loving, like he's just got every quality that you could want and that I think any rider would want but within the first two minutes of my first ride he just knew exactly what I was asking what I wanted and it just clicked. We then went to the World Equestrian Games in Tryon America last year and we came fourth in the individual. You know we've we've now done two international campaigns. I've learned a lot from both of those experiences and I'm really hoping to be able to take everything I've learned and put that towards my Tokyo performance and give it our best shot at hopefully coming home with a medal. It's a, uh, oh, it's a bit old and dirty now, but <laughs> it's uh, actually a proper um, marine harness that they helicopters use to pull people out of the water so it's the real deal uh sturdy i know i'm not going anywhere you're very nosy louie and then this just does that to hold my leg up um, so that the girls can push it easier over the top of the horse's neck onto the other side might need you, Lucy, to grab me back down into my chair. But it's, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But yeah, I can just then undo that as I'm going over and... This is a uh, Big Ben. Uh, and he's our off-the-track um, thoroughbred racehorse. His race name was Pakaya Prince. And again, he's a really, really sweet, sweet guy. We haven't had him for long. He spelled for about three months before we started bringing him back into work. And um, yeah, he's just a really gentle soul. He's seven years old um, and he's big like he's the biggest one we've got here we haven't measured him but I'd say he's got to be at least 17 too uh, and as I just said to these guys it's unusual that the thoroughbred is bigger the biggest horse we've got in the barn uh, when he's standing next to a team of warm blood horses so um, yeah the aim with this guy we're hoping to get him out and about competing in para dressage so I've got an awesome a uh, team of staff that help me at the moment uh, and they are sort of retraining him at, at this stage and he's just learning the ropes of being a, a dressage horse but as I said he's just a really sweet guy I really like his nature his personality uh, and he's he's quite trainable we, we seem to think so we've, we've come across a, a good one